Back when I was making the final edits and changes to On the Subject of Trolls, um, which was about June, July time of this year, June, July of 2019, back then when I was making the final edits to On the Subject of Trolls, when I was reading through the book over and over again, reading through all of the stories, seeing if there was anything I wanted to change about them, uh, and, then, and then changing it. Um, back when I was doing that, I was thinking a lot about how writing on the subject of trolls was in many ways very different to writing Zolantis. Writing these two books was very different. The process for writing them was very different. And uh, back then, as I was thinking about that, I thought I'll make a video on that once the book is out and now here we are. The first way uh, that writing these two books was different, and, and really the main way, the biggest one, the biggest difference between the two, was how the world building was done. With Zolantis, I've, I've said before um, that Zolantis was, is essentially a spin-off story of uh, a series of books that I haven't written yet. Uh, I originally intended to write a different series of books um, set on, on the world of Dazantia that Zolantis is set in. Um, and for that series of books, I did lots of world building at the start. And this is, this is how I tend to do uh, world building generally. This is how I tend to write uh, books and stories generally, is I will start with a lot of world building. Um, particularly if this is a completely different world to Earth, um, or, or just a very different uh, Earth in a very different way. I will start by doing a lot of world building to establish the languages that exist, to establish the technology that exists and the cultural references and so on. Um, before I actually start writing any of the main text of the story, that's what I'll do. Also, in addition to that, in addition to the sort of pure world building things, which is inventing the languages that exist in that world and inventing, inventing the, uh, the, the history of that world. Um, in addition to doing the pure world building, I will also tend to write short stories set in that world that aren't the main story that I want to write, but they're nevertheless set in that world and perhaps maybe even involve some of the characters that will be in the main story. And the reason why I do that is because writing short stories set in a world is a very, very good way uh, to really understand what your world is like and how people interact with things in the world and how things that you've put in the world through world building affect the decisions that people make um, and, and what they think of their surroundings, how they, in, essentially how they interact with the world. So normally, this is my normal method for writing any book, I will start with world building and short stories in order to really develop the world and potentially some of the characters who will be in the main story as well. That's normally how I start, and then I will, um, perhaps I've already done the plan for the story at that point, or I will then do the, the main plan for the story, and then I will actually write the book. That was very much how Zolantis um, happened. With On the Subject of Trolls, however, it was very different to this, it, and it was, um, in a sense, uh, a, a way of doing all of this that is, that is completely atypical for me, in that with On the Subject of Trolls, because they were fairy tales, and there was there's a lot of... There is a lot of flexibility in how you write a fairy tale. Because of that, and because these are set in a sort of mythologized Anglo-Saxon England, which, so, you know, this is medieval fantasy. We're all very familiar with medieval fantasy and the tropes of medieval fantasy, the sorts of things that are in that world. Because of that, I didn't have to do this uh, period of world building before starting the actual stories. I was able to just jump straight into writing the stories because they were fairy tales and because fairy tales just have so much flexibility in how they can be written. And that's what I did with On the Subject of Trolls. I just started by writing. Um, the very first thing I did, I think, was to start writing Throch the Cunning, the first story in the book. Um, and actually, as a side note, all of the story, the stories in On the Subject of Trolls, um, the, the order that they appear in the book is, is the order that they were written, or, or rather it's, it's the order that they that I started writing them in. Um, I didn't necessarily finish them in the order that they end up in, but I, I started them in the order that they're in in the book. So I just started on the subject of trolls by writing the first story. Uh, and then when I had another story idea, I just wrote the next one and added it in. Now you might think that there wouldn't be much world building to do with a book like On the Subject of Trolls. It's set in a mythologized Anglo-Saxon England. Not much is all that different from the real Anglo-Saxon England. Um, there, are, there are no new languages in the book, unlike with uh, Zolantis, where there are several distinct languages that appear in the book, some more prominently than others. 
but there are several distinct languages in the book and they've all got to have their own um, distinct phonology and way of representing that phonology. On the subject of trolls, it doesn't really have any of this. It has various Old English words in it, Old English names in particular, um, and other words which perhaps were more, more common in the Anglo-Saxon period um, that have been brought forwards and modernized a bit and put in the book. But this isn't the same as inventing an entire language. So one might think that there isn't much world building in on the subject of trolls. There wouldn't, there wouldn't have been much world building to do for this book. But there actually was um, a, a fair amount of world building to do. I mean, it's a shorter book than Zolantis, which means there was just less generally to do. But there, there was actually some world building to do for on the subject of trolls, particularly around names and how Old English words um, are, are used in those names. A particular, I mean, the, the names of the trolls had to be invented. That was less so part of the world building. There, a lot of edits did happen to the names of the trolls in some cases, but um, there's, a, there's only five of them. They're quite simple. But all of the names of the other characters, all of the, the kings and um, other uh, lords and so on, all of their names, uh, a lot of world building had to be done with all of that. And a lot of the names of the towns as well, a lot of world building had to be done there. And this was because even though a lot of this book, uh, sorry, a lot of the, the words that appear in this book that aren't familiar to us in modern English, even though a lot of those words, which is mainly names, are based on Old English, this book doesn't uh, represent Old English in the ways that uh, people who've read pieces of Old English would be used to. There, there had to be a lot of decisions in writing this book as to how Old English and Old English words and Old English names had to be represented. So balancing things such as would a modern English reader be able to roughly pronounce or roughly understand how this word might sound. So there was world building to do with this book in terms of deciding how Old English was represented. This, this was also true for uh, names of towns that appear in the book. There are ver various towns are named in this book. Some of them are real towns, towns like Chernchester and Wintonchester. These towns really exist, they really existed at, at the time that this book is set um, in, a, in our real world, and they still exist today, they just have uh, modernised names. Some of the towns like that were real, and I had to decide how do I want to write the names of those towns in this book, particularly because at the time that this story is hypothetically set, or these stories are hypothetically set, um, the names of these towns weren't necessarily standardised in the way that they are today. So I had to decide how am I going to represent those names, um, and also for the towns that didn't exist, because in some cases I didn't want to make an explicit reference to a town that really existed. For the towns that didn't exist, how was I going to name them? What was I going to call them? Often this uh, involved I would name, choose to name a town like Thorsbury as one of the towns in the book, um, which, and, and this is just, uh, it literally just means Thor's town or Thor's um, bury, um, Thor being obviously uh, the Norse god and also the old English god. Um, uh, deciding all of that, how am I going to name these towns? Am I, am I going to add any significance to the names of these towns? There was all of the world building involved in that. So there was a lot of world building to do. But the difference with on the subject of trolls compared to Zedantis was that with this book, it was all done at the end. Well, I say all done. A lot of it was done at the end of writing the book. Once I'd written all of the stories, um, I went back through the book and there were lots of things that I changed. I changed lots of the names of towns and some of the names of characters, um, particularly side characters, uh, and even some of the names of the trolls. Um, I made various documents about lists of um, trees that exist, uh, trees that are native to England and what their old English names were, um, and common endings for uh, town names that, uh, that, are, that exist in um, English town names, and what their old English counterpart would have been, whether that would have even existed in old English. So I did a lot of that sort of stuff, only once I'd written all or pretty much all of the stories in the book. And this, this was very different to writing Zelantis, and this is very atypical for how I tend to do things. Um, if I'm writing a story which involves a, a, a very different world, a, a completely imagined world, then I will always start with the world building and trying to understand how does this world work, what is, exists in this world, what is possible in this world, and then I will write the story under those constraints. So in this regard, On the Subject of Trolls was very different. Another way that writing On the Subject of Trolls was very different to writing Zolantis um, is with how it worked 
with my drafting system. In order to explain this, I'm going to have to explain how I manage drafts of the book and uh, saves of the book. So I do all of my writing in Microsoft Word, uh, just because that's what I've had for ages and that's what I've gotten used to using. But because in over the last sort of 10, 15 years, in through, you know, through using Microsoft Word for all kinds of things, I've gotten used to this sense that sometimes Microsoft Word can go wrong and it can crash and completely corrupt your file and then you've lost everything. Um, I've become very, very cautious in terms of how I save um, drafts of my book and versions of uh, my book as I'm writing it. Um, and many years ago now, I don't know how long ago, possibly, um, possibly since, I don't know, 2011, 2012, something like that. The way that I manage um, saves and drafts of the book is that on each new day that I do any kind of uh, writing, I will create a new, what I call draft of the book, but really this is more like a new save of the book. So if on a, a Saturday I do some more uh, writing in the book, I will create a new draft of the book, which might be like draft 17 by that point or something. If I do then some more writing on the Sunday, I will create a new draft and that is draft 18. So every new day on which I do any writing um, becomes a new draft of the book. This means that drafts for me are very different to drafts for other people. For a lot of people, they'll have their first draft of the book and that's, that's a complete version of the book. It still needs to be edited, but it's, it's the complete story. Um, and then draft two might be something very, very different to that. The, the concepts of saves and drafts are separated for, for most people, but for me, they are one thing. So this means that there are just loads of drafts um, of my book in, in the particular in the folder where that book is, is kept. Um, for Zolantis, um, using this method of drafting, I think in the end there were, I think it was about 235 drafts of Zolantis in the end. The, the, the draft that was published was draft 235. And between each of those drafts, not very much changes. In the earlier drafts, maybe a thousand words was added or two thousand words was added. And in the later drafts, maybe you know, several pages were changed. So not much changes between each of those drafts. They're not drafts in the conventional sense. Um, they're more, they're, you know, the more saves of the file. But for Zolantis, there were over 200 drafts, drafts in the end. And I think for Zolantis, perhaps the first half of those were writing the book. So all the way up to halfway through that, that you know, 100 and something, maybe it's like 150. Through all of that, that was just adding to the story, getting to the point where the story was finished. And then after that, it was editing it. Um, with On the Subject of Trolls, it was very different. Um, with On the Subject of Trolls, I, I wrote the stories very, very quickly. And really, it was by about draft 10 or 11 of the book, so only 10, 10 days of actually writing new material into the book, um, 10 or 11 days. It, it was by that point that really most of the book, or all of the book, was done. Um, it was in the first 10 or 11 saves slash drafts of the book that most of the book, almost all of the, the stories in the book were completely finished. However, um, it, the, the actual draft of On the Subject of Trills that is published is something like draft 90. So there was another 75, 80 drafts of the book where I was making only very s small changes to the book. Some of the stories that I wrote in this book, when I uh, wrote them, I was just able to write them pretty much exactly how I wanted them the first time. This was um, true with Cluthk uh, the First and Plog the Common. I was pretty much able to write these exactly how I wanted them the first time. So, uh, and so they didn't really need much editing, and they didn't really change much from draft 10 to draft 90. I, I don't think I'd written them, but I think it was maybe like draft 12 or something that I wrote, wrote those uh, stories. But they pretty much didn't change throughout all of those versions of the book, and it was just adjustments to the other stories and, and rewriting sections of the other stories that really changed all of that. So in that regard, On the Subject of Tools was very, very different to Zolantis in that I was able to get to... a uh, a complete set of stories, if not, but, but not perfected, um, very, very quickly in the drafting process. And a huge number of the drafts were taken up by edits to the book. Another big way in which writing on the subject of trolls was very different to writing Zolantis was in how was the, the, the degree to which planning was important. 
For on the subject of trolls, I, I discovered as I was writing the book, planning was absolutely essential. Now, with my books, I um, plan, plan out the entire book beforehand quite methodically. With uh, Zolantis, so I, with Zolantis, I started, and, and with um, previous books that I tried to write, I started with um, what I just call a plan, which is a, the, the rough outline of the entire story. And then I will go through and make a, what I call a detailed plan, which is, which is essentially the same plan, but with a lot more filled out. The, um, the plan, this, my terminology is, is perhaps not the easiest to, um, to understand, but what I just call the plan is generally an outline of the major events of the, uh, of the book, major events of the plot. Whereas the detailed plan, hypothetically, this was very much the case with Zolantis, is supposed to go into every important um, conversation that the characters have, every, every important thing they think, so that when it comes to actually writing the book, I won't be surprised by a character saying something in a conversation or responding to something in a conversation that would actually make, make them want to do something differently. Um, because what I don't want is to get three quarters or halfway through the book um, a character has a conversation and I realise, actually, no, this character wouldn't decide to do this at that point. They'd decide to do something else and then have to change the rest of the book. Um, I would ideally like to avoid that situation, which is why I do a detailed plan. So Zolantis, the way I write generally is to uh, quite methodically plan the stories that I'm writing. This was very much the case with Zolantis. Um, however, with on the subject of trolls, I found that um, planning was even more important. With, with Zolantis, I probably could have gotten away with not doing a plan, if that were the way I, I liked to write. I probably could have gotten away with it, because the plot of Zolantis is very, very simple. With On the Subject of Trolls, there was absolutely no way of writing these stories without having a very, very specific plan of what was going to happen in them. With, let me see, with uh, Cluth the First and Plog the Common, both of these stories, I wrote out um, a fairly comprehensive plan for the person, really trying to understand how, the very distinct ways that the trolls act. And that meant that when I wrote those final two stories in the book, I was just able to write them um, straight through very easily, get almost everything the way I wanted it the first time. With, the, with Throck, the Cunning, and Flunge, the Indignant, however, when I started writing those stories, I didn't have uh, plans for them. I had rough ideas for how they would be, but I didn't have particularly detailed plans for them. And as I r went through the stories, I found, as I was writing them, that I would get to these impasses where I just didn't know quite how the story would have to progress from here, and nothing that I was choosing seemed right. And in the end, I realised that the way to resolve this was to retroactively plan the stories, go back and write a plan for them, understand how they have to work, um, and then change whatever is necessary in the text that I've written so far so that then I can get to the end of the story and have it make sense. So with both of those stories, um, and this was very, very true of Flunge the Indignant. Flunge the Indignant was a very difficult story to write because she, Flunge is such an unusual troll and has very, very particular behaviours. Um, with Flunge the Indignant, I, I had written the whole thing. Um, I'd written a, a version of the whole thing and I, I kept reading through it and thinking this this doesn't seem quite right. Something seems not quite right here. So I had to go back, retroactively plan it, um, as almost as though I'd not, not written a version of it, before, of it before, and then go back through the actual story and change, in some cases massively, change uh, parts of the story in order to fit the new plan. And, I mean, I imagine that anyone reading the book probably wouldn't notice this if they were reading through the, the, the stories. But certainly, when I read through the stories, I notice the points at which um, the, the retroactively made plan started to act upon the story and started to um, enact the changes um, on the story that it needed to. Because it, it almost seems like the stories change in direction or tone ever so slightly at certain points. Uh, and that's, that was indicative of where um, a retroactive plan changed the course of the story a bit. So I think with Throch the Cunning, it is... Uh, the, the part where the retroactive plan kicks in is the market scene, where it's the, the troll and the old woman. Um, that scene was completely different originally. I say completely different. Th thematically, it was very different originally. Um, but uh, the, when I did the retroactive plan and, and went to change it 
uh, went to change that scene, it ended up changing quite a lot. And I think, well, I mean, I think it may be possible to tell just by looking at the, the style of the writing around that point. And it, it almost picks up momentum at that point um, in the story. It almost just before that, it's almost like it's um, slowing down a bit. And then at that moment, it seems like it really picks up momentum and, and maintains it to the end. Um, and I think that's because that's where the plan kicked in. So planning was incredibly important for these stories to the point where they, they pretty much couldn't be written without a very, very thorough and methodical plan. And this has very much influenced how the subsequent books in the series are being written. I'm currently writing um, on the subject of Trills 2. It's not going to be called that. Um, but I'm currently writing that. And for this book, I do not even start on a story without having a very comprehensive plan of the story before going into it. So at, at the time I'm recording this, one of the stories is complete. That went that went incredibly well. I was able to write that very, very quickly. And again, again I think this is because I had a very, very detailed plan of it and what everything meant beforehand. Um, the other story that is about seven-eighths finished also had a very thorough plan um, be before I started writing it. And I, I think it really, really shows the, um, the story just holds together better because of the plan. No time is wasted on things that are irrelevant. Um, it, will, it will spend time on things that really, really matter to the ideas of the story, and then it will skip over the bits that don't matter. So it really seems to be working, and hopefully for the other three stories that will go into the book, it will work as well. And then the final way, well, the final big-ish way in which writing on the subject of Trolls was different to writing Zolantis. Well, this, this is also about the, the plans um, for the stories, which is that the plans for each of the stories in the book look very, very different to the stories themselves. Um, the plans at the moment are just on my uh, flash drive and they, they can't be seen anywhere. One day, I, I have thought that one day it might be nice to actually write these out in a nice way and release them so that then anyone can compare what the plan of it was to what the story actually ended up being. And this, this might be quite interesting because the plans are so very different to the final stories. They look very different. And this is because the plans uh, talk entirely in terms of um, the uh, metaphor of the stories, the allegory of the stories. So rather than the stories talking about... Um, say, uh, flunge or fluff and, and what they're doing and what their particular personalities are doing. It talks entirely about this is a, a certain type of troll. This is what this type of troll does. This is what um, the meaning of this character is uh, in this world. If, if in that particular story, a king happens to represent um, the, uh, the government or the state or a, a news organization, um, it, it references all of this stuff constantly in the plans and reading the plans the you know they might be almost unrecognizable compared to the final story this was very different to zolantis the plan for zolantis is or is just a um an extended synopsis it is it just describes what happens in the book and what the characters do um this was because zolantis was uh zolantis isn't an allegorical story um so that there, there was no allegory to explain in the plan it was just about explaining the plot Whereas for On the Subject of Drills, because all of the stories are so intensely allegorical, the most important thing about each story is that the meaning of it is, is correct, that the, the allegorical meaning of it, what it's supposed to be a, a big metaphor for, um, is correct. That was the most important thing. And all of the um, stuff about how the trolls look, how they sound, um, the interesting imagery and so on in the world, all of that was completely secondary uh, in this book. The thing that really had to be right was the meaning. So that was the that was the fourth way in which, uh, fourth big-ish way in which uh, writing on the subject of tools was different to writing Zolantis. So that was several of the ways in which writing on the subject of trolls was different to writing Zolantis. Um, if this is the first video of mine that you've seen, it's a bit of an odd video to choose as the first video, but if this is the first video of mine that you've seen, and now that you've heard about on the subject of trolls, um, if you hadn't heard about it before, somehow, um, you're now interested in reading the story. As usual, the links are in the description below. Um, and the, on other videos or this video, there'll be links to where you can find Zolantis if you're interested in that as well.
The purpose of this channel uh, is to expand upon the books that I write, um, which means making lots of videos about um, the, the worlds that these stories are set in, so the, the mythologized Anglo-Saxon England that on the subject of trails is set in, and the world of Byzantia, and all the other ones that uh, will come along. Um, rambling about those, um, all of the, the languages that exist in the culture and the technology, um, rambling about the process of world building and the process of writing, as was the case with this video, um, and all kinds of other things, um, rambling about film and television, science fiction, fantasy film and television, and so on. So if you're interested in any of that stuff, there's already loads of videos on this channel that are about that, and there will be lot, lots more to come over the next few weeks and months as well. So if you're interested in all of that, go and have a look at that now.